love your your handheld name that's fantastic and uh, you're wondering if I ever miss the animal characters when I'm on leave all the time I'm always excited to go on leave because it's nice to have mornings to sleep in and to to go and do well things that you don't get to do in the bush all the time but normally after about four days I'm done and I'm ready to come back again and I'm definitely going to miss the African wildlife when I head to Australia uh, it's going to be interesting I'm going to try and see as much of the wildlife around Australia that I can but I don't know if I'm going to get that adrenaline fix perhaps if I find some big saltwater crocs or maybe the odd snake lurking in the garden not necessarily the gardens but the farms that my family most of my family live on perhaps um, but uh, yeah we'll see we'll see what we're going to get up to but I, I will I'll miss the elephants I will miss all of the animals out here so much particularly the elephants I think are the ones I miss the most the interactions that you have in the vehicles with them that's from my favorite and the smells not even just the animals the smell that you get out here is so clean and fresh and the early mornings the sunsets and the sunrises you can't compare them when you're in the city they're just not the same at all navigation around the gate itself which may require me to jump out but James has now traveled all the way to Cheetah Plains there was apparently lots of action last night happening around in Koro and those areas who knows who may pop out in Kanyeni quarantine got my fingers crossed for you James let's go see how he's going Well, no, none of those. We've got an elephant here. I'm not sure where Taylor's got her information from that there was major action here on <laughs> Cheetah Plains. I can't, I received no such such information. Uh, anyway, there is an elephant. That's not quarantine. Quarantine, of course, is a leopard. In Kanyeni, also a leopard. Um, and she said to me earlier this morning, she said, are you going to Cheetah Plains to follow up on all that action? I said, um, what are you talking about? And, uh, well, here we are on Cheetah Plains looking for action, and we found some just behind a termite mound. Now, the reason that there is an aerial in your shot is that we drove past the bush that that elephant is hiding behind, and we didn't see the elephant, and so it got a bit of a fright, and we got a bit of a fright, so we just stopped, and we just thought we'd just let things ride a bit. Well, that's just interesting. That's a young bull the one in front and that one now opening her ears to us and telling us that she's not that comfortable with us as a cow. Now there are two things that are interesting about that. The first is that they will tell you that a cow's tusks do not grow out from the front, they grow downwards. It is very clearly not the case with her. How do I know she's a cow? Well I know she's a cow if I look between her front legs I can see very clearly that she's got mammary glands there. She's also got thin tusks, which is characteristic of the cows. David, am I talking rubbish? I don't think I'm talking rubbish. <laughs> I'm just seeing something, something else there. But that, of course, as we, most of you will know, elephants have got internal genitalia. No, she's definitely got mammary glands, but she is dripping from the nether regions there. I'm not sure why. Let's just keep watching. Maybe I've made a mistake. That'll be an embarrassing mistake, but maybe I have. No, I haven't. She's definitely a female. She's pregnant, that's why. Can you see how the big swelling... I wonder if she isn't quite close to actually giving birth. She's certainly got itchy legs. I don't know if that's got anything to do with giving birth. Wonderful stuff. Let me just go a little bit back. An electric vehicle, an electric vehicle, my kingdom for an electric vehicle. It's all right, my dear. I promise you we mean no harm. She's not an 
old cow, but maybe she's the matriarch of this little herd. I don't know how many elephants are here exactly. I've only seen three. And that's very classic behavior, saying, listen, I'm not comfortable. She's now moving the youngster away. Now, it's interesting, a cow like this is, when I say she's not very old, I would put her at about 20 or so, maybe a little bit older, maybe 25. And so the likelihood of her actually giving us a proper rev, you know, having a go at us is small. But it's not impossible. But the point is, we don't really want to push her to the point that she either wants to run away or attack us. Sorry, Dave, I know this isn't a great picture for you, but I'm not going to move at this stage. She's not very happy. And so our only movement from here would be to move away from her, to increase the space so that she could see that we meant no harm to her. I am not somebody who subscribes to the school of thought that we need to show the animals who are boss, because, well, I'm under no illusions as to who's boss. And Cindy, you're saying you wonder if she isn't in labor. Well, Cindy, I don't think that that's a bad thought because she's definitely dripping from where the baby would come out and she's also got that very distinctive flow of uh, hormone from the glands there, the temporal gland, and that indicates stress whatever kind of stress it is so she could easily be coming into labor or maybe she's just having cramps or I don't know something painful but she's definitely not in the happiest mood she's ever been in hmm. all right I think we're going to move on from these chaps we're just going to let them quietly enjoy their day and I'm just going to roll the car forward rather than start the engine You know, and she's just watching us go quite carefully. S Tristan, I nearly said Steph, but I meant Tristan, of course, has got something flying, but it has no backbone. ...in the male. But it's quite common to see them on these Waltharias. They're often around, and you can actually see the little flower of the Waltharia just underneath them. So they'll be getting the nectar from that. And that is what they'll be feeding on. Very, very nice. Now... If we just sit here and we we are just sitting and it is actually the most amazing thing just to listen to all the sounds. So there is a lot of birds calling so I'll keep quiet for just two seconds just so you can hear all the birds around me and hear the sounds of the morning as it starts to get going. Isn't that amazing? So you can hear monotonous larks, there's some of the cape turtle doves, there's the rattling cysticula that's shouting at us, that bzz, 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 bzz. and the monotonous larks are the ones that are making that beautiful little call in the background. Now, for those of you that are only joining us now, my name is Tristan, so I'm on bushwalk this morning and we're looking at all things little this morning. We're trying to find smaller things that because Taylor had a leopard and James has had hyenas and elephants. They've been getting all the big animals so I thought we'd start focusing more on little things and see what else is out here. It's actually quite incredible how many small little flowers I've seen come up um, in the last few days. There's been lots of flowering plants. These were areas where the butterfly was sitting had no flowers a week ago. They were done flowering and a little bit of rain that we had has just spruced everything up and we're finding that there's a lot more flowers in fact there's another beautiful flower right here so, if you have a look in there you see that there is this beautiful African violet is that not the most sensational color it's incredible so so vibrant maybe let me get these out the way for you Exe how's that is that a bit better isn't that amazing now these guys only come up after the rain, we don't see them too much 
before the rain starts so if you it hasn't rained you won't see them but they are really really pretty little flowers and stand out quite a bit amongst the drabness of the rest of the greens and browns that we see in the bush so we're going to carry on looking for little things and little insects and while we do that let's go across to Taylor and see where she is and what she's up to We've got a couple of mongoose that are playing just off of Triple M on an animal pathway. Now, there's actually quite a few of them here and hopefully they're going to come back out again. They're playing so nicely. But it's typical for them to bob and weave in the long grass. They don't want to stay out in the open for too long. Because if they do, they run the risk of being spotted by a predator of some sort. Mostly a bird of prey, a raptor of some sort. Or We'll swoop on over and snatch them up. Hello. Look, look, look. It's mom. Mom feeding them. Did you see she had something in her mouth? A worm of some sort. And now the little pups have come over to try and, of course, snatch it up. Oh, look how tiny they are. Hello, little one. Very hungry and very satisfied with that, obviously, as well as it licks its lips. Everything that eats grass. And hopefully they'll flatten it for us. Because I'd love to see some of these little ones grow with mom and the rest of the family but that's what the Chit chatter I think they're living in termite mount somewhere around here but we're going to carry on I'll give you an update about the Nguhumas the next time that you come to me but let's go back across to James and see if he's found any more elephants and now pretty much in their only path. So if they come too much closer, I'm just going to move slightly off the road so that they can have a bit more space. And let, in fact, let me do that now. Because what we don't want to do, especially in a situation like this, I don't think, is have an effect on the situation. We ideally just want to observe it. But I think it's already too late for that. I think the young one is now interested in us. So I'm just going to move to a position where there is space on either side of us so that he can go around us. I hope we're going to maintain picture. Megan, you'll have to tell me. We should be fine here. We certainly have been before. And just go all the way back to the junction here. Hello, new wave. I wonder if you're a new viewer. <laughs> you want to know what the average lifespan of an elephant is. New wave, the average lifespan of an, of an elephant in this area is probably about 55 to 60 years. Maybe a little bit older. Sometimes 65. I tend to go with the lower estimates because I'm not sure that we really know and so it just sounds slightly less exaggerated but yeah up to up to 70 years in some places where the food's a bit softer and I suspect in captivity probably also up to about 70 years right now we can observe what's going on here without them paying too much attention to us and I suspect they're going to go off towards the water which is three in a row pans not too far from here. Now why did this make me feel slightly uncomfortable? I don't know. There's just something about the vibe that the big bull is giving off that made me slightly uncomfortable. That might be completely psychological. There's now a game drive vehicle behind them obviously. See he's turned to look It's fascinating. I'm not sure that I've seen this before, you know. You hear about big bulls having two or three Ascaris at a time. This chap's just got one. And the... Uh, so let's... I mean, let's give a... Oh, man. I'm not sure where you left off there, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, 
I think I'm going to guess their ages. I would say that the front one is less than 20. And the back one, not very old, probably 35 odd. Which, David, I know sounds old to you, but really it isn't. Mm. Well, of course, the great legend is that an elephant never forgets. And you say, do they have good memories? They do, you know. They have excellent memories, apparently, even for people. But they have hugely impressive memories for where water and food sources are. And it's a hugely important part of elephant societal life that the older ones pass on that knowledge to the smaller ones to tell them where to find water when times are tough, which kinds of plants I suspect to eat at which times of year. I think that that is taught. It's very difficult to prove, but I'm pretty sure that that's what's taught. And it would seem that that would take a fair amount of memory to remember the vast distances that they move, to remember where all of the water and the food is. And you do hear stories, anecdotal tales, of elephants who have come into contact with people, probably through domestic contact, and then the elephant's been set free or put to the wild, and they recognize the people uh, again, sort of after years apart. Now, it's very interesting that he just completely ignored us. He's not vaguely interested in what we're doing. He's the interaction is entirely between these two bulls. Mandy, you're wondering about what we do if the elephants charge us. Well, the first thing we do is scream very loudly. Then we wave our hands above our heads. And if that doesn't work, then what we start to do is... Um, uh, sort of tear our clothes off in abject fear and then drop them on the floor and run away. Mandy, I'm being completely facetious. If an elephant charges, normally they will warn you, Mandy. So first of all, if an elephant has got to the point that it is so irritated with you that it's going to charge, normally you haven't picked up the signs. And if you have picked up the signs, that what you will do is make sure that the vehicle is in a position that it can go away frontwards. You do not want to be reversing away from an elephant bull. So let's pretend that this chap suddenly turned around towards us, lifted his ears, showed that he was irritated, then put his, flapped his ears back and came in a full charge. From this position here, I would simply swing the car to the left onto the road and drive at a great speed. You can only, really, during a serious charge, man, if an elephant is serious about charging as opposed to just walking towards you with his head up which is a warning more than anything else the only course of action is to get out of there you've got to move and so the big thing that we learned when we started off guiding especially in the early 2000s when the elephants weren't nearly as relaxed as they are now was that you never went into an elephant sighting without a forward escape route you often sat there with your hand on the key just so that you could start quickly and move out and you left the car in gear. So you would always have the car in first gear and so you could just start and move if you had to. And that's just the way it happens. But remember, an elephant will almost always uh, remind you or tell you and explain to you, in not words obviously, that it is upset and uncomfortable. And if you move that way, if you increase that space, normally that will be fine. Tristan has now got the precursor to the backboneless flying creature he had earlier. We do indeed, James. We've got the ever-present caterpillars on the Waltheria. And these are the same caterpillars that James had when he was doing them in the tent for the TV shows. And I don't think we've come with an ID yet. I don't know if James maybe ID'd them. I certainly haven't found a positive ID for them. I've looked around, but nothing as yet. You can see they're a lot larger than when James had them. Ah, so James says they are part of the Acrea family, which would make sense with those little spiky hairs that they've got on them and the little black ones that are around the face. Now, you can see they're absolutely demolishing that leaf, eating their way slowly but surely through it. And it's quite incredible to see how they've grown over the summer. We've been seeing them from when they were absolutely tiny. And they've slowly but surely grown and grown and grown. And in fact, I can actually see some very, very small ones in the background. So you can see how much they've grown. If we come here. 
Let's see if we can find them. I did spot one here somewhere. Where was it? Ah, there we are. They're on the other side. So I wasn't crazy, but you can see them there. They're still very, very little at that stage, and they slowly but surely then grow a little bit bigger. Now if you want a sort of size reference, there's my finger in amongst them. So you can see they're still very tiny there, whereas the ones that we were looking at just now are probably already about half the size of my finger. They've grown a lot more, and these guys should all start pupating and coming into adults fairly shortly. Well, they're going to have to because winter is fast approaching, and they're not going to do so well in winter because all these Waltherias will die back. Waltheria actually doesn't last very long in the summer months at all. I mean, in the winter months, should I say? No, it's amazing how far Tingana has walked. We're on close to Treehouse Dam at the moment, and his tracks come all the way up here. And Herbie was saying it just shows you how difficult tracking can be because if you came across these tracks, these tracks look quite fresh. They're on top of most of the nocturnal animals, so you would think, well, this leopard is not too far away. But actually, this leopard has already crossed into Buffalo's Hook, so it's gone a long way from here. And it just shows you'd be on foot and you would walk all that way only to find that he's already long gone. And the only hope that you have when you're following on foot and you find tracks like this is that the leopard has gone stationary somewhere. So either you hear alarm calls or you hear some sort of sign that that animal is in front of you or it goes stationary and it lies down somewhere and then you'll be able to track it down and find it. Otherwise, it's a very, very long process. It will take you all day to follow these and to try and catch up with him. And that's just when he's walking on the road. You can imagine now when he starts going into this thicket how difficult it's going to be to even follow any footprints through that. That there is a carpet of grass and a light-footed animal like a leopard is not going to leave the biggest signs that it was there. It's going to be really tough. The only nice thing about following tracks especially of a territorial male like this as he's doing his territorial patrol is that you walk along and every now and then you just get that whiff of buttery popcorn that Taylor was alluding to this morning as he's scent marked so it's quite pleasant actually you've got these beautiful smells that are drifting through the breeze as you walk so very 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 pleasant at all very nice of Tingana to leave that although apparently it's making Herbie very hungry Herbie said to me he's very hungry this morning and so I'm sure the smell of buttery popcorn is not ideal for <laughs> for somebody who is hungry it's amazing how popcorn can make you feel hungry even when you're not Right, we're going to go down towards Treehouse Pan and see if there's any sign of anything there. I know I had some buffalo bulls yesterday close to Treehouse Dam, so I'm hoping maybe they'll be around, or maybe some Ellies that are coming for an early morning drink. And while we do that, let's go across to Taylor and see if maybe she's got any more anti-gremlin dances for us, or what she's up to this morning. Nope. I'm done with dances for the year now, you've seen it all. I will not get more ridiculous than that. Ah, hornbills. Hi hornbills. They're half munching on the road. Now I want to tell you before I get into discussion about the... Oh, hang on, wait, no, let's talk about the hornbills. Look at them. No, so, they've now destroyed, this is obviously the main culprit of uh, the animals that get rid of the temporary structures that termites like to make in the middle of the night. It looks like they, their mound is, they're starting to increase their mound. But uh, alas, the Godzilla yellow-billed hornbill has come through and completely demolished their buildings. That is not very nice. But of course they need to do it. They've got to eat and termites are full of fat and full of protein. So it's one of the main reasons as to why they will do something like that. <clears throat> and those termites will be alright as soon as the first hornbill landed and started smashing its beak against that newly sort of compacted soil that they've got there they all would have started to descend the soldiers would have come out to try and protect the mound but once they realized that there are birds and things there i'm sure that they all went no we're out of here we're gonna go underground hey wormy and there they are i've even got a worm now have a look here an inchworm that we've picked up from somewhere and go. I love this. Whoop. <laughs> I love the way that they move. It's really fascinating watching caterpillars and I'm not sure which caterpillar you had with Tristan but either way some of the inchworms which is uh, most likely a larvae of a moth. Oh and a spider. VM look at the spark spider. Come here. Oh no. I chased it away. It was so beautiful because it had so much red on it. Let me see if I can see it again. 
Oh my goodness, it's rolled up into a tiny little ball. It looks like a piece of bark, literally. Let me ca catch it. I don't want to pick it up because I don't want to get bitten. So we'll try and get it gently. Here it is. That is a beautiful bark spider. And as you can see, when I pull their front legs up towards their, their jaws, their, their fangs, they completely, completely blend in. I'm going to bring my leather, my multi-tool here, just to show you. How, that's the edge of the pliers. Look how small it is. And if you're not convinced, let me show you my, my little finger. That is my little finger. Now there's a vehicle just behind us. So let me just pull off the road and we'll have another little chat about our worm and our spider, who luckily for us not going too far. But let's do this. We'll just pull off the road like here. Right. Now something that's really amazing, and I'm hoping that this little bark spider will actually walk for us. Let me see if I can just encourage it a little bit. Here we go. Now it's hiding again. See how it brings its legs in. It becomes completely camouflaged. Now you can also see how tiny the worm is. It is really, really small, the two of them. And a bark spider would eat something like this, but they don't actively hunt. So I'm uncertain. I don't think that this bark spider would just go and catch that caterpillar now. They build webs. And they utilize those webs and obviously it traps the prey that they can't move around so much. Then they will bite it and inject it with venom. And then after that, they'll wrap it up in a silken cocoon where they'll eat it. They'll either eat it straight away or they'll eat it a little bit later. But this worm also doesn't, this little inchworm doesn't seem to be too bothered at all by the spider. Do you want to be released? You can't go down there. That's actually really pretty. Now, spider, please walk so we can see the beautiful bright red that you have in between your legs. It is really quite nice. And it's just amazing as well the things that you pick up as you're driving around in the bush. Ant lions, driver ants, lunar moths. I've picked up a lunar moth before. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. <laughs> Isn't this interesting? We've just taken a break now from all the big cats and we're focusing on some of the smaller things. So what I wanted to tell you about the Nkuhumas as you watch this little wormy move around was sadly we did see all the tracks of three lionesses and six cubs um, but unfortunately they go across to the Manuleti. They look like they, they had a good investigate around all the warden's houses, literally walking right up the fence line, smelling the gates and all types of things, because there are a couple of anti-poaching dogs in that area too. So I'm sure they were quite uh, inquisitive as to what those smells were. But sadly, they didn't come back onto our traverse. They just popped through for a quick visit and they have gone north. So whether they're just sitting behind Sydney's dams, Sydney's dam, or if they've gone into the Manuleti, I'm not exactly sure. They definitely went around there somewhere. Right. Get back in your pouch. Put that away. And you two, we'll, we'll put you out in a moment. Maybe we should do that now quickly. Just drop them off. Now I have to take it out again. A little wormy, I shall pick you up very gently. Wormy does not want to be picked up. But yes, I think it's time that we release these animals. You guys don't need to stay here. Wormy, come. That was easy. Here's your new home on this branch, on this bush willow. There we go, got your footing. Bark spider, you next. Now this is going to be tricky, but you can actually see the red that I was talking about. <laughs> Look at this spider, how cool is it? What are you doing now? Let's see what this little spider is doing. It's very inquisitive. I might keep it for a little bit longer. Aren't you beautiful? Right, we're going to try and very gently put this bark spider on a tree somewhere. But before James's bird flies away, let's go and have a look at a kingfisher. Yes, before the bird flies away. And indeed, that little mini, mini, mini bark spider, as I, it was described to me, uh, we'll have to watch out for a woodland kingfisher because a woodland kingfisher would eat a mini mini bark spider. Even a mini 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 bark spider. And you may have noticed that while the monotonous lark has become the loudest thing in the wilderness, the woodland kingfisher has become largely silent over the last little while. 
the breeding season, David, is over. And as I was describing yesterday on sighting the great massing of the barn swallows before their trip back to the north, the quieting or changing of the dawn chorus and the calls around here leaves one with a feeling of slight melancholy that the end of the season has come. <laughs> I see we have a um, we have a question here from a aficionado of the Game of Thrones. The Song of Fire and Ice. Uh, Tormund Giantsbane, uh, thank you for your question. I'm afraid that's all I heard from your question. The only thing I heard was your name, and I was so astounded and therefore did not hear the question. Ah, you say, where do they go in the summer? They go into North Africa, do the woodland kingfishers. They go, I think, to Senegal, actually, that's sort of far northwestern Africa, but they go into the, just north of the equatorial region, into the savannas around there, just south of the Sahara. There we go, it's giving a little bit of a call. It's nice to hear still. Let's see if it gives another one. Thank you, Tormund Giant Spain. Very beautiful bird. All right, let's leave him. What we're going to do, we're going to the sort of northeastern corner of Cheetah Plains. That's pretty much just over there. And we're going there because Inkanyeni and her baby were seen around there uh, yesterday, I think. Not on Cheetah Plains, just on Ankoro, on the Ankoro side. Now Tristan is still knocking about with worms and he'd like to tell you some more about them. Indeed we have James, but this is absolutely incredible. We've come along to Treehouse Dam and Eggsy spotted this dead tree that's got a whole bunch of the caterpillars that are going through the next stage of the life cycle. So they are all going into the pupa or chrysalis phase where they are prepping to go under this development and change where they are going to become the adult butterfly. So you can see there's the caterpillar that is the yellow one with a little spiky black on it. So I would imagine it's another one of the Acrea families. It looks very similar to the other ones we had but it's black spikes go throughout the body. And then just to the right of that you you can see there's another one that is starting to go under the change. You can see the wings that are starting to form and the actual coloration is changing completely and it's absolutely incredible to see this process taking place. I am going to definitely come here on a day-to-day -day basis and try and follow to see what goes on. You can see they spread out all over the place. We've got them all up the sides here. Here's another one that's busy changing and you can actually see the little tiny wings there developing inside that casing. It's absolutely amazing. I'm so chuffed that we found this. Well done Eggsy. This is very very cool. Like I say I want to come and see exactly what they are. Well, Mandy, a lot of them will have bright colorations that are yellows and blacks and that generally signif signals to any animal out here that they are toxic in some way or that they are not tasty to eat. It's called aposomatic coloration. So you find blacks and reds, blues and reds, greens and reds, yellows and reds, um, and yellows and blacks and combinations of all those colors will make animals think twice about eating them. So that's the one side of it. The other side of it is this particular tree that they're busy doing the pupating on is a very short sharp thorn tree. It's called a buffalo thorn. So it's got these lots of little spikes. So it's quite difficult for anything to negotiate this. If I put my hand in there, I'm not going to be very upset with life because I'm going to get spiked all over the place. And then the other thing is that when they're in this stage here, they have this hard, almost exoskeleton that goes over them. So that chrysalis is quite tough and quite hard and it's very difficult for anything to break into them. I'm sure one or two of them might get grabbed by a roller at some point and especially when they hatch and they come out, then you're going to find that they're a little bit uh, susceptible, sorry, to um, predation. So you're going to find that, that while the wings are still drying out, then they get grabbed a little bit. But most of them will try and feed off a toxic plant when they're a caterpillar. That helps to make them a little bit toxic as the caterpillar and then therefore not fed upon. But in this stage, they're using the tree as a defensive mechanism. So all these spiky thorns are helping just to keep these little guys quite safe.
Well, Sam, I'm not 100% sure if these ones are. I want to actually ID them. So I haven't seen these yellow ones with the black spikes yet this summer. So I want to go back and just ID exactly which ones they are. But it, depending on the species, they could possibly be. Like I say, generally when they have bright colors like this, yellows and blacks, it tends to signify that they might have some sort of toxin in them. Um, it might just be a fooling process so sometimes you'll find that some of them mimic so they'll be able to have those colorations just to try and fool predators they actually aren't toxic at all but it will be difficult to say without actually identifying the exact species and knowing exactly what this plot this caterpillar would have fed off because the buffalo thorn that you see here is not what that caterpillar grew up on it would have grown up on another type of plant and it's just moved to this open branch with thorns for protection and then when it hatches it's nice and open that it can dry wings very very quickly and fly out of here it doesn't want to be in a place where it's foliated because if this buffalo thorn had lots of leaves on it you're going to find many other animals are going to come feed off it so things like elephant kudu they're going to come and feed off that plant and then disturb this whole process so they use these dead trees a lot more when they do this so it will be interesting to see i'll definitely try and id them this afternoon or during the day today and then i'll be able to answer that with a bit more authority as to whether these are toxic or not but like i say that coloration tends to suggest that they might be when things are a little bit yellow in coloration with those black markings then it tends to suggest that they might have that or like i say that they're just mimicking but isn't that amazing? That's the first time I've come across a tree that has so many. Generally, you just find one in a tree, but to find so many together is really quite incredible. And like I say, it'll be an interesting thing to come daily and just see the progress of those chrysalis and see how they develop. They should get much larger, and you should see the wings slowly starting to grow within that chrysalis. It should be really, really cool to follow. Right, now we're going to carry on, start turning back northwards, otherwise we're only going to get home around lunchtime. So we're going to start turning back northwards, and while we do that let's go back to Taylor who's now ended her dance career apparently but maybe she'll sing you a song no nope, no song singing today either Tristan we just having quite normal day today I haven't been normal for a while so I thought that we would just uh, we'll try and behave for a change but um, I have one thing I have discovered is that uh, Philemon's cut line is the road of flies I think that's where all the flies come from. Oh, wait! Very annoying. They're all landing on us, but I did, I got some, which is good. And um, I wanted to also tell you, so we're watching that bark spider just now. I'm on my way to the hyena den. I just want to see if it's managed, if it's become reactive again. You never know. It's such, it's warming up quite nicely. But that bark spider now lives in Rusty. It's now its home. We saw it stick up at cephalothorax earlier and I couldn't quite see what it was doing. And I think it was releasing silk. And um, because the next minute after we linked away, um, that spider jumped onto a little little line and went all the way towards VM's camera, which was quite amazing. And it wasn't there before. So I think that it was releasing silk uh, from its spinnerets and then the slight breeze that we have today obviously then drifted it and then it got stuck onto the camera. So it's now living around there, which is nice. So I know James had the hyenas out earlier, but I really just wanted to come and have a quick little look around here in case, because I haven't seen these cubs for such a long time and I miss them because they're so lovely. But I think our luck has run out for this morning. I think it started and stopped sadly with Tingana because there is nothing here. Right, that's okay. I'd be lucky all the time. Let's carry on. I'm still looking for elephants. Oh, still have yet to see my or have my elephant fix for the day. Possibly we'll get it a bit later. And now I feel as though it's warm. I'm going to have to take this jersey off in a minute. Bye, hyenas. Have a good sleep. Maybe see you this afternoon. Off we go. Ah, oh, I've got an idea. Let's see. If there's anywhere in particular where any of you that are watching would like me to go, maybe there's a nest you'd like me to follow up on or anything along those lines. So think of something for me to do and then you can hashtag Safari Live with it. Seeing as though we haven't got too many more plans and then I shall go and investigate whatever you go and tell me to do. How does that sound? Right, but we're gonna carry on searching now and we're gonna go all the way back across the Cheetah Plains with James. Maybe he will sing you a song.
No, he won't sing you a song. That's a <laughs> that was a cheap shot. <laughs> you know, the problem is that Taylor is such a good sport that when she says something like that, it makes you feel a bit bad to refuse her. Let's uh, see if we can't spot something else around here first, and then I will decide whether or not I should sing you a song. I was hoping desperately of course that there would be a cheetah here there is not a cheetah well there could be a cheetah three feet from the road we just wouldn't be able to tell and then i was hoping for this red collared widow now here comes a zitting sesticula and i stopped here and i thought well we might also be able to show the white winged widow there it is no it was the starling yeah, there's a starling. And all around us, the monotonous larks. So maybe for them, the breeding season has not ended. It really is such a pretty sound. I'm trying to think of an appropriate song to sing, but I don't think that I can think of one. David, can you think of an appropriate song to sing? Mm -hmm. The viewers are now demanding, apparently, that I sing a song. Do <laughs> you think that's allowed, David? Do you think they can demand that I sing a song? A song about a monotonous lark. You mean you want me to make one up as I go along? No, I know what I'm going to sing. I know what I'm going to sing. <clears throat> I haven't sung this for a long time. It's a Celine Dion classic. Um, it's all coming back to me now. And by the time I have finished singing this song, I am willing to bet that I will never ever be asked to sing a song again on Game Drive. Are you ready, David? Yes, yes. <clears throat> well, there were nights when the wind was so cold There were days when I thought that I was going to die I don't know the words, so I make them up. I was driving on cheetah planes Hoping for the collared widow bird to fly in the sky But I was driving and the cheetah looked it up It was chasing an impala across the plains And as I saw it run I thought to myself By God can it survive? But when it runs like that And when the Impala snorts like that It was gone with the wind And it's all coming back to me It's all coming back It's coming back to me now It's all coming back It's coming back to me now Another highlight There were nights of endless pleasure there were times I thought that I would die Baby, baby, baby When you touch me like that And when you kiss me like that It was gone with the wind But it's all coming back to me No! There's a bird over there, it's a yellow-billed hornbill Thank you. Do you think that will have sufficiently cured everybody of a need to hear me sing on Game Drive? This is a particularly ill-equipped hornbill. Doesn't seem to be very good at uh, hanging around in the trees. There's the stony silence from the final control, and I suspect most people have now logged off and gone on to get on with their days or nights. And what I suspect this hornbill is doing is looking for caterpillars in the same way that Tristan is looking for caterpillars. 
It's always good to get that out of your system, you know, David. Sometimes one must sing like Celine Dion. Although if Celine Dion is watching, I don't think she would have thought I sounded anything like her. I think we've lost communications, that's why we've got a stony silence. Try once again. Michelle, yes? I've got you now. <laughs> Michelle has nothing to say about my song. She says, do the hornbills migrate to other areas in the winter? Michelle, they do not. The hornbills do not migrate anywhere. They live here permanently. Uh, they just become slightly more silent during the course of the winter time. I just, uh, you know what, I think that walking across these plains might be a better bet. Thank you. Taylor thought I was singing opera. That's wonderful. It's of course, because uh, Taylor has clearly never heard proper opera before, because no opera singer would be confused with uh, what I just delivered there. Appalling, appalling stuff. Ooh. Rebecca says that I sound like her and her girlfriends on a night out. That's horrific. What is that? I think it's a moth. Let me go and have a look. <laughs> Oops, I'm going to have to go around the other side, sorry. <laughs> it was gone with the wind, but it's all coming back to me. No. It is not a moth. I think it's an egg sac. I think it's a covering and inside it are probably eggs. Of what kind of a creature I couldn't begin to tell you. I'll just prod it gently. It's quite hard. I would suspect that there are some kind of insect eggs stuck in there. Why it should be that white colour, I don't know. Maybe, again, to disguise it as a, well, uh, a bird poop. Oh, you touch me like that. It's gone with the wind, but it's all coming back for me now. Good. On we go. Ah, Tristan seems to have found something further. Uh, this time, not a worm, uh, a little creature. Well, James, indeed. The little worms are now a thing of the past and we are watching the busy effectiveness of ants, I would say. is probably a good way to describe this. But you can see all these grass seeds from the panicum grass, which Jamie so enjoys, and I suppose all of us, we all pick it and end up eating it at some point. But you can see what's happening is the ants have all gone and they've gone and collected bits of this grass and seeds, and they're busy taking it down into their little hole over there. Isn't it amazing, the feverish activity that's going on, and how many ants there actually are in this area. It's quite amazing to see how efficient they are and how much work goes into keeping this colony alive. So inside here underneath this base will be a whole bunch of ants that will be busy moving around. It's quite incredible to see how much work that is. And you can imagine lifting one of those seeds is like us lifting a 20 kilogram bag of potatoes or something and carrying it home on your back. It's not the most easy thing to do. So quite amazing to be able to watch. Now I'm very impressed with James, his singing capabilities, although I feel like his Celine Dion wasn't great. Now I can't sing at all. Eggsy and I have just been chatting about this. Eggsy told me a very sad story about how his dreams were crushed when he wanted to be a rock star and he went and studied journalism and he went for a radio interview and they told him that even radio, his voice is no good, that he shouldn't even bother with singing because there's no chance. So I'm sorry about that Eggsy. Don't worry, my dreams were also crushed when I was a youngster. I used to think that I was an opera star when I was a kid and 
I used to sit in the shower and belt out all these opera songs and one day my mom pulled me aside and told me that she loves me very much but I have lots of other talents and singing is definitely not one of them and so I should really try and avoid singing as much as possible for the safety of everybody else's ears. So James, at least your voice is a bit like a monotonous lark, whereas mine and Eggsy we seem to be like Hardy does, unfortunately. I don't know where Taylor fits in this whole grand scheme of things. She's somewhere in between, I think. Although she's not shy of singing a little song around camp, actually. Taylor's always got some sort of vibe going and songs are being sung and it's quite infectious. It makes everybody else do it. You find everybody else just kind of blurting out little rhymes here and there. It's quite funny, actually, to watch. But um, like I said, we are slowly but surely making our way home. And it was quite funny. We we were sitting on one of the roads here and walking along and Taylor came past us and she didn't even notice us so you need to have a word with her because had we been a group of lions we would have been walking down the road and she would have just missed us completely. We even tried to shout at her and she didn't hear us so she needs to be more vigilant otherwise she's going to miss things as she goes. But so far, other than all the insects that we've had and monotonous larks that seem to have followed us everywhere this morning and been calling the whole way Taylor says she'd be an annoying crowned lapwing. Well, I suppose she does make enough noise to be a, a lapwing. She could definitely be that, although she's not quite as squeaky as that. I don't know. I think we can find a better one, Taylor. I'm sure there's another bird that we can think of. Let me, let me give it some thought and see what bird we can relate you to. But I suppose a lapwing is fairly fitting. I wonder, Brent would definitely be in the hardy dog category. What do you think, Eggsy? Uh, I think so as well. Jamie, what do you think about Jamie? Yeah, Jamie, I don't know. I haven't heard her singing yet, but I, I feel like Jamie, she would produce a fairly nice sound. So maybe Jamie will be part of the canaries. Oh, Herbie stopped me. To, oh, there we go. That's very, very nice. We've got a little praying mantis. There we go. Let me try to get that open for you there, Eggsy. It's amazing how much life is on these Waltherias. It's incredible you have all the caterpillars we had that butterfly earlier now we've got the praying mantis and the praying mantis obviously gets its name from its forelegs so if oh i've just disturbed it sorry the way that it holds its forelegs it looks like it's busy praying so it holds its two legs together and lifts them up towards its face and so that's how it got its name but these guys are quite incredible you find that the males are unfortunately abused a little bit in the relationship. Um, yesterday we had quite an in-depth conversation about males and how they handle relationships and why we just don't understand females and James was giving us a big lecture about it and it was very entertaining to listen to the whole thing and hear the disagreeing and agreeing on behalf of the men and the disagreeing and agreeing on behalf of the women. It was very funny but in a mantid relationship things are very much one-sided. I suppose that's like our relationships too. The women absolutely dominate. You'll find that they often kill the males by decapitating them which is really quite something. Thank goodness in human society we don't have that situation because I feel like many of us men would not survive very long if that was the case. But if you look down here, you see there's also so those caterpillars we've been seeing all morning on the Waltherias, have a look at this. Down here are the brand, brand, brand new ones. Look at how small those are. They're absolutely minute. So we've been seeing all sizes. We saw the big ones, which I'm sure are almost ready to go into a chrysalis form. Then we saw the medium ones. And now we've seen the brand new ones that these must have just hatched from eggs. They can't be too old at all. I would say within a few days maybe since they've hatched. Quite incredible. What a lovely morning it's been for butterflies and caterpillars. And it's been quite incredible to see what's been going on. And amazing that there's such a late bloom of all these butterflies. Careful, Eggsy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Eggsy just walked into a tree, unfortunately. <laughs> this is the hazards of being a cameraman on Bushwalk. He's so focused on looking at me that sometimes they walk into things. And I only notice too late as well. Sorry about that, Eggsy. Right, we're going to carry on. And let's go across to our crowned lapwing herself and see what she's going to be scoring about. I'm a bit concerned now about Eggsy walking into trees and things like that. That's a bit sad. <laughs> Funny at the same time. What I'm going to do is I've actually got something that I want to show you. But I'm just going to stop at the top of uh, Twin Dams so that we can have a good look. Ah, and there's also Impala which is nice. Hi guys. 
Let's see if there's a hippopotamus. No hippopotamus. Right. So this is something that I've actually been looking for for quite some time. Let me do it here. Sorry, VM. I can't decide which way I want to sit. I'm going to put it here so you can actually see it. Have a look at this plant. Now some of you may actually recognize it because you get it all over the world. And it is a type of a sedge, so it's got a very angular stem to it. And this particular one is called purple nut sedge. And it's been dubbed the world's most invasive plant. You can find it in over 90 different countries. How incredible is that? So it's native to South Africa as well as Central Europe and also Australia. And in Asia, I think you find it too. And even though it's quite invasive, it's actually a very handy plant to have around. Now, the part of the plant that we can see, unfortunately, is not the part that is useful. But they've got massive tubers that grow underneath uh, the ground and they are a very good source of starch and carbohydrates so it's a plant that James would never touch basically and it's incredible so the tubers can get quite long they can get to about 20 centimeters so sort of about that long and they're bitter tasting um, but it's definitely a massive diet and it actually form a, a large part of the diet for the aborigines in Australia as well as in sort of famine stricken countries in Africa too so it's quite important you see it growing everywhere particularly in, in disturbed areas where it's quite dry it doesn't like moisture too much um, but because it's such a tough plant it can um, well survive uh, wettish areas too so we see it a lot in the drainage systems and you'll see it around here where the ground has been disturbed quite a bit uh, but I just find that it, it is just so amazing how something like this that causes massive problems and kills lots of crops uh, so it's got it basically you would call this type of a plant um, allelopathic which means and there's many different plants that do this is that it has a harmful substance that it exudes from its roots so it kills everything else around it so when it does in, infest crops so corn uh, or maize and any wheat anything that you can think of it becomes a challenge for those crops to grow around it because literally uh, they cannot survive in the toxic soils that this plant has then created and it is so strong and I don't know if you've ever seen it if you're into gardening and uh, some people will put that black gardening plastic down on the ground um, to try and prevent weeds from coming up that does not stop this stuff this stuff actually pushes through all that plastic which is quite amazing but nevertheless it's also got a couple of medicinal uses but what I'll do is I'm actually going to try and find some more of it uh, later this afternoon when I do bushwalk and we'll try and dig one out now, Laura, you're wondering if you can use this as a dye. I haven't read anything particular about um, turning this into a dye at all. It's not quite like the Indigofera tinctoria, which is which is known, the indigo dye plant, which we see around as well. And um, what you can do, and we'll try and dig out a tuber because I want to taste it. They describe it as as being quite bitter, um, but you can it's edible. So we'll, we'll see if we can dig one out. We'll do it on bushwalk this afternoon. Um, but what you can do with the tubers is, and and what people would do is they take the tubers, they put them on a fire and they take the burnt ashes and they'd apply it to wounds so scratches and cuts and bruises um, anything like that and that was actually to help relieve it but it's an amazing plant but there's a couple of things that I also want I want to tell you but I'm gonna save it for a little bit later because we'll go into a nice proper discussion about this when we can dig out the entire plant um, just to see how it sort of grows because the whole way that it grows underground is actually quite interesting with the various tubers and roots so we shall save it and I found some nice ones on Weaver's Nest, so that's what we will do. Right, <clears throat> are we going to keep searching for elephants? Because I'm not going home until we find an elephant. So VM, I hope you're ready for a long day. But I'm going to send you across to Tristan. As you've seen, he's on walk and he's also looking at a variety of plants. So we are, Taylor. The Yesterday afternoon, I believe that Project Alpha was asking James on Bushwalk if he could find her a Bushveld gardenia. So Project Alpha, if you are watching, then we have found your gardenia for you. Unfortunately, it has been pushed over by elephants, so it is lying on a bit of a precarious position, but it is still growing. The leaves are still green, there is fresh shoots, so it means the roots are still in place. It's just going to grow at a funny angle now, which is going to be quite interesting to watch. But this is the gardenia. It's quite easy to identify with this sort of whitish colored bark, and then these 
little leaflets that come out in threes around a central stem and so you can ID it from that way and fortunately they're not flowering at the moment they have the most spectacular beautiful little cream white flowers that then turn yellow as they get older and you see them in the spring before the sort of major rains come along now Herbie was telling me a very interesting story about this tree and how they use it with the Sangomas so in this area we have these traditional healers or Sangomas as they're called and they are people that a lot of the community members will go to when they have ailments and he was saying that when they are in training they will use this plant quite a lot and it's basically how it works is that the instructor that is teaching these traditional healers he basically goes and harvests a branch and they look for these branches that are quite close to the tip that have these little sticks protruding off them or little branches coming off them and they basically will go in the very early in the morning every morning and they take it and they put it in water and they rub it like this and it produces a foam and then from there they have to put their hands behind their back and then they go down and they eat that foam and they say that it is a sign of respect but it also connects them and the instructor together so that they can glean more in knowledge and information and be able to then follow in that instructor's footprints which is quite amazing now the reason why I found it quite interesting is because what I know about this plant is that the fruits as well as the leaves can induce vomiting so they use it as a way of cleansing the stomach so particularly if you have intestinal worms of some sort so any of those worms they take this plant and it helps just to cleanse it out and you induce vomiting so I was quite surprised to hear that these guys actually eat the foam and that it doesn't cause vomiting it must be something to do with the water that dilutes that um, chemical that causes the vomiting process so quite interesting it's amazing what you can learn out here so you know it's 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 an incredible thing to be able to combine western world knowledge with the cultural knowledge as well um, Sassy you're wondering if we see wild sage we do I haven't seen for a few days now I'll, I'll keep a lookout now as we go but we do get it in this area um, it's quite common so let me see if I can find you some I uh, like I say haven't seen any this morning but I will look around for some and see if I can find it. You often find it in the presence of the wild basils and so quarantine will be a good place to look which is where we're heading so I'll try and keep an eye out for it and be able to then show you a little bit later. But as I was saying just now it's amazing that the western world and the cultural world combine and you get these interesting facts that come together and you know that's the amazing part of working with somebody like Herbie I'm sure some of you may have saw the video that we posted online yesterday about Herbie and his story and it's you know we come from a from a thing where we learn from books and a little bit of from experience but they have so much knowledge of a very different kind and uses of these plants that we as western people don't quite understand because we often go to the pharmacy and we buy medicines so to work alongside somebody like that who can teach you these things and show you these things is quite amazing and it's, it's constantly a learning experience both ways so Herbie and I were just talking about it now showing him another plant called a cor coral tree and we were kind of discussing it and so he's learning from us and we're learning from him and it just makes it such a nice relationship to have particularly on these bushwalks it adds so much value to have his influence as well right we're going to carry on I'm going to go see if I can find a sage and while I do that let's go to Taylor who see if she's still on a quest for elephants and whether she's had any success No, Tristan, our luck has completely run out. I'm checking all the favorite water holes now. So we just had Chele Pan. But sadly, it doesn't look like there's anything here. Let's have a quick squiz though. You never know, maybe there's a bird having a drink of water. Yeah, here we'll have a gap. Nope. Very quiet at the moment. Not even a dove having a sip of water. Egyptian geese that normally live around here have moved on. Very, very quiet. But I'm sure as the day goes on and it warms up, we'll definitely start to see more things. Let's go check Pangolin Track. Maybe we get lucky. There's all those lovely... Oh no, what about Ingwe Ali? Should we do that? Yes, change my mind. We'll do a quick loop. We'll go uh, down here and then we'll take the, the secret road. And we'll go through there, have a quick look around, and then if nothing, then we'll do pangolin trap. We'll just keep going round and round and round, hoping to find, well, something with a long trunk. Let's see. Now, they're always around here. And whether they're just feeding in the drainage systems, 
which is probably the case, which will explain why they're so hidden. Is that a blister beetle? Can you see there's that fl big flower in here? Yes, yeah, straight in there, you've got it. Keep it on there. I'm going to I'm going to start the car. The camera's going to shake. I'm just trying to get a view for VM of this flower cuz I think there's a blister beetle in there. Now that's a flower that I don't want to go sticking. Yes, it is. It's a CMR beetle. Look at that. Feasting, eating away at the flower. Now this is one that you don't want to touch because of the cantharidin. If uh, you get that stuff all over your body, you are going to blister up. Now, it's quite a big beetle. Like I said, I'm not going to go and touch it. You can, uh, but It's probably the length of your index finger I would use to describe it because I'm most definitely are going to end up with severe blistering on my body and nobody wants that. It's the most horrendous thing. I've only ever had one incident with a blister beetle before, a CMR beetle, in, uh, uh, in Zambia. One fell on me out of a tree and then of course I panicked and I swatted it and it got very upset with me and I had uh, these boils, I suppose you could call them, not quite boils, but big blistering all down my neck and on my face which was not pleasant at all so we won't be doing that anytime soon but they love to eat the flowers, you can see munching away at the moment along with the polyrhynchus ant also feasting on the flowers and that's really cool, nice to see, there's a couple of them moving around there and they're all eating all these hibiscus at the moment. Very cool. Right, pity it's just so far away, we can't really get in there. But that'll be a nice spot actually this afternoon, seeing as I'm doing bushwalkers, maybe we'll go about and start checking all these flowers. Starlight Cam, you're wondering if it's dangerous to have a bark spider wandering around on the vehicle. No, not at all. They're actually really pleasant. Uh, they do have a bit of a painful bite, but uh, and they've of course got a, a venom, but nothing that can hurt us as humans. I remember being bitten by a bark spider years and years and years ago in the Eastern Cape because they were just they were everywhere going down into the valleys and massive ones. I mean, we used to see bark spiders. I kid you not. Let me put it on the back of my hand. They're about that big. I mean, they were they really, really were absolutely massive, and being having one of those fall on you or go down your shirt, as anything would, they start to panic. And I had a little bit of a headache, a very slight headache, but it also could have just been a coincidence. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, so no, not at all. They're quite pleasant to have around. They're really entertaining to watch. Normally during the days, they'll be resting up on the underside of a branch, with like we saw, closing their legs in, and almost just look like a little knob on a tree. They're so camouflaged. And then at night they start to set up their webs again over the middle of a road and then they take them down at first light. Now what is dangerous to have in the cars, which we have on a regular basis, are uh, violin spiders and button spiders. Uh, they seem to make an appearance every now and then and that's not great. I think Brent actually said he had baby button spiders in this radio, in this mic, living where the holes on the speaker are. And Yes, that wasn't fun, but they've all left us now, which is great. So every time we get into the cars, you'll see, oh, you guys don't see it, but first thing in the morning, we take the blankets that we sit on to sort of just boost us a bit higher. We shake them out. I check everywhere, under the steering wheel, uh, anywhere that I'm going to touch, because the last thing that you want to do is pick up uh, the radio mic or, or, you know, reach down to pick up the spotlight, and then you get nipped by one of those spiders. Now, that won't be very fun at all. You're, you'll probably have, be quite ill, depending, of course, on the size of the spider and the amount of venom that you get in your body. But we don't want to be rushing anybody off to hospital. So we, we try and be as careful as we can. Hello, Redback Shrike. You see that there's two hopping around. Go up a little bit, I think it is. No, now it's, it's flown off. Oh, no, it's there somewhere. I think you've got it, VM. Yes, you do. It's just to the right. I think we can just see its tail moving. It is there. That is so camouflaged. Look at that. No, that's not the one we're looking at. That is something else. That looks like a bunt. Is it a bunting? I can't see. No, it's so striped and hidden behind. Come out. Come out, come out, come out wherever you are so we can see who you are. There were two redback shrike bounding around. I can't see who this is. 
you just see a lot of barring on the chest and initially it looked like it could have been a bunting of some sort maybe it's a, one of the female buntings let me just have a very quick look at my bird app let me get that out now come out yeah and show yourself I'm just searching as you stare into the bush mm. let's see no I don't think it is either I don't know what that is let's go and try and get another look at it did it fly away oh it's a robin there we go that's what it is maybe it's a white browed scrub robin that's what we saw here it is now I can see it I'm gonna just try if they're so skittish though don't fly it's just in here if you can see it hopping around, Vim. There it is. It's hiding away, but it's definitely one of the robins. Most likely a scrub robin. I shall just double check. White browed? Yeah, it is a white browed scrub robin. And I'll show you a clearer picture, but quite a nice one. They've got the most beautiful call. I'll play the call for you in a moment. I just don't want to play it as we sit next to this bird because they're quite territorial. And if I play it, it's going to respond. Uh, I don't want to upset the bird, especially because it is only... I'm going to start the engine. It might fly, but I want to see if we can reposition slightly. But obviously it's difficult because this bird is so small. So we need to keep the camera on it to see where we're going to get a bit... Okay, let me go forward now. Yes, I think we're going to get a better gap here. Here we go, almost. Whoa, good, good. <laughs> this is hard. Okay, hold on, we're going to get a good view. Oh, no. <laughs> it just flew down. Ah, oh, okay. Let me show you. It just flew off. Let me show you the picture of a white-browed scrub robin, though. A proper look at it. Let me get a real photo. Now I need to do the, the sleeve rub. Just to clean my screen. It's full of dust. Okay. Too much glare, VM? Here we go. So have a quick look at it. That was what we were looking at, the white-browed scrub robin. And it is now flown off, which is a pity. Um, but it should be here. It's beautiful call. I think so. Now we've got to do... Oh my goodness, it's a disaster. Turn that off. Click on it again. Are you ready? Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. That's definitely a sound that you hear first thing in the morning, which is really, really nice. Of course, make sure I turn that off volume. What a nice little bird. I don't know when I last actually saw a white browed scrub robin. Initially, though, like I said, when I saw it, I saw the streaking on the head. I couldn't see the breast, and I thought, oh, maybe it's a. a uh, bunting but of course then as I started to see the barring on the chest straight away nope that wasn't it there we go so a nice little find for the morning what we're gonna do is we're still searching for elephants and we're gonna keep searching like I said right until we find one but let's go back across to Tristan and he's had he's actually had all the luck in the world with the caterpillars and plants and I wonder what he's got to show you next so what we have here is the larvae for a glow bug oh, that's what we call them here and now it's very very fast and it's moving around and it's on the hunt these guys are predatory little bugs and they are ferocious and what it's busy doing is probably looking for ant lions. so if you have a look in this hole over here you see there that the sand is actually moving so if I try to disturb it a little bit so what happens is they build these little pits and then an ant comes and it touches the side and that falling sand triggers the little ant lion to come up and so this little insect is coming along and checking all of these little pits looking for that ant lion and let's see if it maybe finds one it'll be quite interesting to see they like I say are ferocious predators they are very quick you can see they're fast moving and they move around looking for signs uh, it might go into its little burrow and stay in there they do go in there and that's where they'll find safety if there would be a predator that arrived so a bird or something then they quickly run into these little holes and they can hide out but it's quite a horrid looking thing it's all armor plated and it's got those big jaws in front it's quite something this little guy 
It's amazing that they grow up to be this beautiful insect that flies around with this mesmerizing light at night. Whereas when they're like this, they're these predators and they move around and cause havoc and destruction as they go. It's quite something to see. Now, obviously he's found something there. Sad, you're wondering what the most dangerous insect is here. Hmm, that would... Ah, Tad. Sorry, Tad. I always say sad. I always get it wrong. I do apologize, Tad, and thank you for the message that you sent me the other day. Now, Tad, you're wondering what the most dangerous insect that we have here is. It's difficult. Um, I'm just trying to think what would probably be one that would be the most harmful. Obviously, when we, th we think about insects, often people will classify spiders and scorpions in that, and they're not really actually part of the insect family. They're arachnids, so a little bit different, of which we have quite a number of dangerous ones but insect wise probably mosquitoes are the most dangerous one you know if they carry malaria they can be very 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 dangerous and probably close behind them is the ticks and the reason why I say ticks is that you can get tick bite fever so it's not that you die from it but you're going to be violently ill it's not going to be very pleasant and we can all ask Craig the cameraman when he comes back he's busy booked off sick because of tick bite fever and I saw him yesterday and he doesn't look very good at all I feel sorry for Craig he's battling a little bit but hopefully he'll come right he does have his medication and so slowly but surely he should be coming right but I would say probably mosquitoes number one because of the malaria factor and then uh, Vanessa, you were wondering how Craig is. Well, like I say, he wasn't looking good yesterday and he seems to be slowly getting better though and hopefully we'll get an update on him today. I've, we left long before he was awake so I'm hoping that later today he does wake up and we can be able to chat to him and see how he feels. But I think he'll be alright. Ah, it's the crowned lapwing herself. The crowned lapwing is trying to sneak past but she's too loud. We, we heard her. So she's here joining us. What do you reckon is the most dangerous insect that we have out here? But, it's dangerous. Yes, the most dangerous, Taylor. Humans or just in to humans, I suppose, is the question. I don't know. I think I'm not. A fan. I think I'm not a fan of blister beetles. I've just no, blister beetles are I just painful experience. haven't had a great. But I don't. I mean, that's not life threatening. It's not life threatening. No mosquito. Surely? I suppose mosquito. Yeah, it has to be the mosquito. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the silent killer. Exactly. <gasps> the snail. You gotta watch out for those snails, eh? They're slow but sneaky. Slow but sneaky. <laughs> Did you hear that story that Graham had with the snails? That Bill Hazia, without it being diagnosed, and eventually they found it in a blood bank because he went to London to have his blood tested oh because he had an issue with his eyes, and they eventually picked up that he had had Bill Hazia for the last 18 years or something. That's crazy. Very, very so I crazy. Had it for two years. I Lovely. Bill Hazia got treated. It reoccurred. Didn't know that I'd got got it again, and then recently, a couple of months ago, I got treated again for it. Lovely. I'm waiting for the second bath, the third time to have it. After our frogging. After our frogging. Ah, yes. very nice. All right, Taylor, <laughs> you you have fun. Carry on. Bye guys. Thank Goodbye. You we won't. Don't worry. I think we'll be just fine. The McCurdy Hurdy is vicious, but not that bad. <laughs> so, Taylor says that the McCurdy Hurdy is trained and that they will protect her and that they'll eat us if we get too close. So, we have to be a bit careful. But yes, Tad. So, in answer to your question, I would say mosquitoes with malaria would be probably the most dangerous. But there are a lot of other insects that cause a lot of discomfort out here. So Taylor was saying the blister beetles, they are horrible things. They land on you and they secrete this toxin called cantharidin and it causes this blister to form. And if you pop that blister, it will cause more blisters. It really is very uncomfortable to have them around. So there's a number of different insects that do these kind of things. But malaria is probably the most dangerous for us out here in the African bush. And then if you go further north, the tsetse fly is also a pain in the backside. They bite very badly and are very, very sore. So not very nice at all, I would say. Right, so we've bumped into Taylor. It seems like we're finding all the presenters this morning. We're now going to go across to James, who's behind us, so we can get a rear view of me and Eggsy walking down the road. There they are, everybody. Look at those two absolutely magnificent examples of humanity on the left a very fine guide there we are filled with knowledge dressed appropriately for a guide of course a beard bristling in the morning sun on the right hand side well these are look how they've oppositely dressed each themselves i suppose yes Eggsy is a fine example of humanity he is of course he's had to work very hard to get this look because he comes from cape town 
and he is much more used to dressing uh, in the hipster fashion, which means he dresses in, uh, in skinny jeans and shirts that were made for, I'm not sure what they were made for, really, lumberjacks, small lumberjacks. Especially made for him. Yes. And then, of course, that beard, uh, unlike Tristan's, is, which is about two days' growth, uh, Eggsy has been growing his beard for, how long have you been growing your beard for? Since birth. Since birth. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Good. Good. Right. Have a wonderful time. Thank you. Enjoy your way home. We'll, we'll hopefully maintain signal on quarantine. I, well, I hope so. Yes. Not a it certainly it's isn't. Goodbye, Egbert. And then, of course, possibly the finest example of humanity on all of Juma, possibly the Sabi Sand, the Great Ugo Park, and indeed the Great Limpopo Transfrontier Park. We have Herbert Causa. Very good, thank you. Herbert has been whistling the theme from the good, the bad and the ugly uh, since yesterday. He says it's good to find tracks. Um, it's bad. I forget what the bad was, but it's ugly not to find the animal that you're looking for. Right, we're on quarantine. Let's see if we can't find you one animal before the end of the show. What is that bird on the road there, David? It looks like an ox pecker, but I don't think it's going to catch many oxes there, do you? I can't see. My monitor's gone. Oh, it's not. It's a ground scraper thrush. Very nice. Let's just watch it carefully. Because there is one bird that you can confuse a ground scraper thrush with. And that bird is the dusky lark. I don't think that's a dusky lark. I'm just having a quick look. Is he gone? Yes, you chased away the bird, Tristan. It was a dusky lark, you know. There it is. Uh, and not common in this area, but they will come in a little bit like the monotonous larks. They come in for a little while and then disappear. Non-breeding summer visitor. Interesting. Right, good. Thank you for that. That's all right, Tristan. The one sighting we've had today ruined. Well, we've had no signal. Have you got him there, Herbert? We're about seven kilometers away. Oh, in the top of that tree, somewhere near the Kruger boundary. Now, that's the monotonous lark. Right, we'll do with him. Okay, well that's the monotonous lark. There's a dove below him. That is going to be it from this side of the drive today. I do apologize once again for the odd signal problem that we had. We will do our best to remedy those during the course of the day. In the meantime, for the very last part of the drive, we're going to hand you over to Taylor with a big thank you, and we'll see you this afternoon at 4 o'clock. Right, I'm looking, I'm trying to find the spot. I'll have to ask Kirby. Remember that one morning we had, on the bushwalk, we had that spotted bush snake? And now, you know, I was with Craig, because Craig was so excited that day. I can't, for the life of me, remember which broken marula it was in. But it was, I think it actually could have been further down, maybe closer towards Aubrey's Road. Anyways, we'll try again, but I, w I was hoping to maybe look for that little snakey to see if it was going to come out. But here's another hollowed out marula. Let's see if there's anything living in here. Well, they like to live in little cavities like that. And George, you were actually wondering if I've ever b been bitten by a snake. George, I haven't. Can you believe that? I have not been bitten by a snake, thankfully. But what I have been bitten by is a massive tropical house gecko, which caused much pain to my finger. It was actually in Zambia. It was a massive one. It was about this big. And I found it on the ground. We were grading roads one morning and I wanted to have a closer inspection. So naughty me, I went to pick it up and serves me right. I learned the hard way why you do not pick things up. And it latched onto my finger and would not let go and it drew blood. And it was a very, very painful experience. Thankfully, it wasn't a young water monitor or rock monitor or something like that. Because that would have been absolutely disastrous. So no, I haven't, but I've been bitten by many other things. <coughs> Excuse me. 
many sneezes today as well. I'm trying to think what else I've been bitten by. Spiders I've definitely been bitten by. I haven't been stung by a scorpion yet. Touch wood. Let's hope that we don't ever get stung by a scorpion. Viam, have you been stung by a scorpion? Mm -hmm. He's also shaking his head. Have you been bitten by a snake? Mm -hmm. No. We'll try to keep uh, being, not being bitten by all sorts of things that will, that I think is the preferable way. Aren't you? Viam has been bitten by a parrot. That is horrible. I've also been bitten by parrots before. They're not, not great. Right. We're coming down to the final seconds of the show now, sadly, but I hope that you've enjoyed the morning just as much as all of us here at Wild Earth have. Very exciting, of course, to have Tingana right in the beginning. And thank you for your help for, for helping us locate him. Uh, remember, please join us, of course, for this afternoon's Sunset Safari. I'll be on Bushwalk. And from all of us here, a big thank you. See you this afternoon.